so much. This was really um, interesting and, and fun. Um, I uh, have so many questions. I see there are other people in the audience that do. Um, I, I think I would be remiss by not starting with um, responding to the slide having to do with the Brennan Center. <laughs> so I will start with that. Um, uh, as you indicated, um, we um, found in early October that um, new laws that were passed around the country could have the potential to make it harder for five million Americans to vote. That number has been a moving target. As, um, more laws were passed, and also on the positive side, as um, vote, has there's been a really um, powerful pushback by voters, <coughs> by the courts, by the Department of Justice. So the the, um, the outlook doesn't look as bleak. Um, but um, the, uh, you know, the the question is to whether or not um, what is really the relevant thing to look at in terms of you know the impact of these laws. You know, we do know that these laws um, will, or we, we estimate that these laws will um, affect, make it harder for more than five million people to vote. We know from political science that when you increase the transaction cost from voting that, um, that that affects turnout somehow. We do not know how many people won't actually vote when you make it harder for them to vote, when you put obstacles in their place, especially since many of these laws are new or more restrictive than we've seen before. And even the restrictions that have been in place before haven't been in place long enough for us to actually study their um, turnout effect. But we know that both sides that are um, fighting about this, uh, those that are putting these laws in place, think that they're going to make it hard to hinder people from voting. And those that are fighting against it think that they're going to also hinder people from voting. And we know that, um, and so I guess, so both sides think this is effective. Um, what basis is there for claiming that this is you know, not really something to worry about or that the impact is likely to be small given the dearth of any data on this? Yeah, so the question is how, how do you know how much these laws are going to uh, make a change? So uh, let's point to uh, Indiana and Georgia where after the voter ID laws were put in place, <coughs> turnout actually went up. And so supporters of voter ID say, oh, the reason the turnout went up is that people are more confident that their votes are going to be counted, and therefore they go and vote. Now, to this audience, that's preposterous. When I speak to other audiences, they find it less preposterous. So a big part of it has to do with what your preconceived notions are. Why do I think turnout went up in 2008 in Georgia? Because Barack Obama was on the ballot, the first African American president. African American turnout was through the roof. Um, so we're trying to study these, uh, the effects of these laws on things like turnout. And so the reason I think that voter ID laws are going to have less effect on turnout than some of the claims uh, is uh, based on what we know about Indiana, uh, although some of the newer laws are more restrictive than Indiana's law. Uh, and based upon, uh, I base a lot of this on a study by Lori Manite, who is a uh, very strong advocate for voting rights and has worked for Project Vote as a professor at Rutgers. <laughs> And she says, you know, we don't have data to show the, the, how much of an effect there is, but if there's an effect, it appears to be small. And so by my read of the social science evidence, we're talking about maybe a 1% effect, and this is about what the trial judge found in Pennsylvania. This case is going up to the state Supreme Court. We don't know. It could be more. But the fact that it's hard to find voters who are actually impacted by these laws and can't find a way around them makes me think that, that the effect is not as great. And when it comes to early voting, uh, we're, I think we're certainly going to see in Florida a decline in the number of people who, uh, who vote. Whether that's attributable to the lack of early voting is going to be very hard to say. These are difficult social science puzzles. So the question that I ask is I say, well, is there a good reason to have the law? Right? So is there a good reason to not have uh, early voting on the last three days before the election. And so I don't think there is a good reason other than you're trying to save money, but that doesn't seem to be what the reason is. If there's no good reason for it, we, and, and it makes it easier to vote, I'm in favor of it. I just think that there is um, an exaggeration or a panic on the Democratic side and a, a, and a belief that uh, there is uh, going to be a larger problem than there actually is. What Democrats need to do now if they're concerned about this, is encourage people to vote on the days they can vote, encourage people to get ID when they can get ID, and, and then they're going to continue to fight about these things in, in court. But I think we don't know. And, and I think the, I would also say something like the Texas law, which required people to go up to 250 miles round trip to get an ID, and which didn't accept student IDs, could have a much larger effect than the earlier laws as in Georgia or in Indiana. 
Um, one um, other um, related question. Um, you um, very eloquently described the increasing politicization of the um, rules of election administration and how we conduct election administration. Um, and that has um, certainly infected the state legislatures in, in, in partly reflected in this wave of laws making it harder to vote that we've seen this past year. Um, I, I, I guess one question is, did the fraudulent fraud squad that you describe in your second chapter, I believe it is, win in your view? Have they, if their goal of their effort was to try and persuade people that there is a problem where there wasn't one of fraud and in order to try to, as, as you suggest, push measures that make it harder to vote, like voter ID, like laws that cut back on voter registration, and the fact that now we've seen a huge wave of that direction this year, and it doesn't look like it's going to be abating in the future, have they accomplished their objective? And if so, what can we do to push back? Uh, well, if you look at polling, uh, and I would look, uh, point to a, a great article that's in the Harvard Law Review by uh, Professors Persley and Salibert, uh, Republicans tend to believe that there's a lot of voter fraud. Democrats tend to believe there's a lot of, a lot of voter suppression. I don't think that the fraudulent fraud squad has convinced many Democrats that voter fraud is a problem, but they certainly have convinced Republicans. And so the backup argument I hear a lot is, yeah, it's true there's not a massive amount of voter fraud going on with impersonation. But we need these laws for voter confidence. Well, this personally, a Salibert study shows that the public's confidence in the fairness of the election process is not at all tied with whether or not the state has a voter ID law. So uh, I think it's a fig leaf. Uh, but I do think that it's entered into the uh, Republican mindset in much the same way that in the Democratic mindset, the concerns about <coughs> voter suppression have uh, emerged. So I do think they have been successful in that way. So a development that occurred after I finished the manuscript of my book is that many of the most recent uh, voter ID laws were pushed by ALEC, which is a pro-business group, controversial, we have a number of uh, companies now pulling out from uh, their support of this group. But this was seen as, I think you're right, that both Democrats and Republicans see this as a means of at least moderately suppressing the Democratic vote. I think that that's, uh, whether it's going to have that effect, we don't know, but I think that that's the intention. And the fact that Alec was pushing this, I think, is some evidence that it was seen as a way to get more Republicans into office. I have some more questions, but I, I want to make sure that other people can start by asking questions. So why don't we open it up to the room and come back. Do you have any more questions? Microphone? Yeah, I, are you picking? Uh, sure. Uh, I, just, uh, so it's being recorded, so. Uh, I just wanted to ask a little follow-up to what uh, what you just said. What uh, you just said, if um, if the actual effects of these uh, voter ID laws is, is fairly negligible, uh, then why, why why do you think the Republican Party is pursuing so many of them? I'm, I'm I'm assuming that a lot that you know the guys you know the people who are at the top of this you know have the data that you have. They know that it's not that it, ultimately it's not going to affect a ton of votes. Um, so why, why the why the big push for so many voting laws in these states? Yeah, I suppose first I disagree with the idea that one percent is negligible. We've had too many elections recently decided by one percent. So first of all, in a close election, it could be determinative. That's a big deal in and of itself. So if Pennsylvania were more competitive. Right now, it looks like Romney campaign is abandoning Pennsylvania. But if Pennsylvania were more competitive, I would be very concerned about Pennsylvania's voter ID law, especially in this election. Because from what I can tell, I wasn't at the trial, but from what I can tell of the evidence, uh, it looks like Pennsylvania's going to have a lot of trouble implementing its law, getting IDs into people's hands in time. So I'm very concerned that we have an even larger effect in, uh, in Pennsylvania in the short term. But aside from the, um, the effect in close elections, where 1% could be the difference between one candidate or another winning, I do believe it has these other two effects. One is as a wedge issue. Talking about Democrats stealing elections fits in with a broader theme of uh, urban, minority, union, Chicago, like you think, take all the adjectives, it's about stealing elections. And that fires up the base and delegitimizes the Democratic vote. And so I think it feeds the base. And it also is useful for fundraising. And so I think those are the other motivations for it. That email from, the, uh, from uh, Patrick Rogers to David Iglesias, where he talks about it as a great wedge issue uh, to indict an acorn worker, I think that's what that's all about.
don't need it unless you think. Okay, so speak loud. Um, I'm just curious. I saw a stipulation in the Pennsylvania case, and I don't remember the exact parties, but I think it was the Attorney General, and they basically stipulated that they didn't believe there was any voter fraud. And so why isn't that played up a little bit more when we start to hear this discourse? Well, so the state stipulated for purposes of trial that it knew of no impersonation fraud in the state, and it didn't expect any uh, in there. To me, that should be enough to say that the, the law should be put. Even though I support a national uh, voter ID, which would be coupled with universal voter registration, supported by the government ID, I should tell you, that has united Democrats and Republicans. They all hate it. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I oppose state voter IDs because even though the effects are relatively small, they're being put in place for no good reason, and they're going to disenfranchise at least a small number of voters. And so you think that would be enough. What, this, what the trial judge said was, it's true there's no evidence of this, but the state, under a pretty low level of scrutiny, which we apply to garden variety election rules as to how you're going to run the election, uh, the state doesn't have to prove any fraud uh, to justify the law. It's enough that the state wants to do it to preserve voter confidence. Never mind that studies show that it doesn't improve voter confidence. Um, but he followed the lead of the US Supreme Court, which said as well, in the US Supreme Court case, the Crawford case, Justice Stevens, in I think one of the most disappointing opinions I've read from Justice Stevens, dropped a footnote. We said, there's some evidence of fraud. In the 2004 governor's race in Washington state, there may have been one voter. And then you can go back to Tammany Hall and Boss Tweed. This is where, you know, that's when Justice Stevens was just a young boy in 1898. Um, there's no evidence of a systemic problem with impersonation fraud to support the law. That should be enough, and I think people who oppose the law pointed that out, but it was not enough for the judge who deferred to the legislature. We'll see what the state Supreme Court does when it gets the case later this week. Um, I wanted to ask about the case that's going to be decided by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, a law school classmate is the chief judge of that court, and it's, he's the swing vote, he's a Republican, and on Rachel Maddow, Maddow the other night they were saying, well, he's a very independent guy, so maybe he'll go our way. And uh, I, that raises the larger question of how well courts are dealing with these issues and whether they're, uh, they're bowing to partisan pressures or actually being neutral on this. And secondly, uh, I was reminded recently that the word voting does not appear in the Constitution. And um, is there some kind of constitutional remedy for these kinds of uh, legislative efforts to uh, restrict the right to vote? Okay, so uh, on the first question about how courts decide these cases, there have been a number of cases where courts have divided on party lines, uh, in, or near party lines, uh, in resolving these issues. And I don't think it's because the judges are voting consciously in the issue of, their, uh, of uh, what uh, would help their party with elections. But I do think that like other people who are Democrats or Republicans, they have different views about the prevalence of voter fraud and voter suppression. Again, Republicans tend to think voter fraud is a big problem. Democrats tend to think voter suppression is a big problem. And uh, in the book, I trace litigation. Uh, I think Wendy may have been involved in this in 2008, the, uh, the mismatch case. This was a question about whether Secretary Bruner, who was the Democrat, was required by the Help America Vote Act to match data with the Department of Motor Vehicle, Bureau of Motor Vehicles database, to find possible uh, uh, not, uh, voters who moved or are no longer eligible to vote or moved to the rolls. She wouldn't do it. The Republican Party sued. Went to a trial court judge who was a Republican and said, look at all this acorn fraud. He basically almost said that and he cited to some newspaper articles. We, she's got to do this. It went to the Sixth Circuit to a panel. The two Democrats on the panel said uh, that that judge shouldn't have even looked at that evidence. That wasn't even before the court. She's perfectly within her right to not use this mismatch evidence. The Republican on the panel um, dissented and said voter fraud is a serious problem. This is one way to address it. She has to do it. It went to the Sixth Circuit en banc. They issued a, an opinion which almost perfectly broke down on party lines. There were a couple, of, I think it was one conservative Democrat who voted with the Republicans, but otherwise it broke down on these party lines. And um, I, what was interesting was 
The Republicans on the panel read the Help America Vote Act broadly to require a, uh, to read into it a private right of action, which would allow uh, the, Re the Republican Party to have standing to sue, and did not read the statute literally. All of that going against the way Republicans ordinarily in their jurisprudential ways read statutes. The Democrats read the statute narrowly and textually and rejected the idea that there was a private right of action, exactly opposite from the way Democrats usually read these statutes. Mercifully, the case went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court unanimously said no standing on the part of the Republican Party and the case disappeared. There, that, the Supreme Court was able to get beyond this divide. But I don't have a lot of faith. And again, it's not because I distrust the judges. And I, I talk about this in the book. I try to be very self-conscious. You know, I have political views, too. It's very hard to try to remain above all of this. And it's hard for judges, too. We'll see what happens in the Pennsylvania case. The Pennsylvania court right now has divided three Republicans and three Democrats because the fourth Republican is now on criminal trial, and <laughs> she's not allowed to vote right now. Uh, so if they tie on, on party lines, then the trial judge's decision will stand. But you know, all, the, uh, all the left side's betting is on this uh, Republican justice who sided with the Democrats in a recent redistricting. Judge Castillo. Oh. And then your second question was about uh, a right to vote There's in the Constitution. No right vote, yeah. There's no right to vote in the Constitution. There's a big fight over whether we should have a constitutional amendment to enshrine the right to vote in the Constitution. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I don't, can't imagine that getting out of Congress in three, three quarters of the states. There are attempts. Some of these lawsuits have been constitutional lawsuits to try and uh, uh, use the Equal Protection Clause. And that's part of what we're going to see is how far the protection clause goes in making it, preventing states from making it harder for people to vote. And we don't know exactly where that's going to end up. But so far, um, there have been a number of stories. Democrats are winning now in these lawsuits. I think we're taking, seeing a snapshot of time. We, I, I'm not at all confident that that's where it's going to end up when uh, the appeals are over. I just wanted to add that there is some. Uh uh, some slight, at least, turning of the tide in terms of where the judges are falling in these cases. And there was a decision in the Ninth Circuit um, sitting on bank um, uh, overturning uh, a law that wasn't passed this year. It was passed a couple of years ago that required proof of citizenship to register to vote. And that did not at all divide on partisan line. That was um, uh, that was uh, by a large, a significant majority, seven to two. Um, the law was overturned under a federal statute. It was written by a Bush appointee. Even um, Judge Kaczynski gave a very strong opinion in favor of that, um, reversing his prior opinion. So that we, we are seeing um, some uh, shakeup of the, you know, the um, partisan um, <coughs> background of the judges in these cases this year. to hear your take on the possible rehabilitation of the Bush v. Gore Equal Protection Standard in the upcoming Sixth Circuit cases. So uh, if you remember Bush versus Gore, and some of you are too young to remember, and some of you <coughs> probably already forgot, but uh, the way that the case ended was that the Supreme Court said that uh, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, first the court said that the Constitution doesn't guarantee a right to vote for president. But that once, the, because the state legislatures are given plenary power to decide how electors are chosen. And you may remember in Florida, the Florida legislature was thinking, you know, maybe we're going to pick our own slate of electors, and there were going to be competing slates of electors. Um, uh, but the court in Bush versus Gore said, once the right to vote is granted, the state may not, by arbitrary and disparate treatment, value one person's vote over that of another. And so it's that language that people are trying to figure out what does it mean. And. Uh, I wrote a piece in the Stanford Law Review in 2007 called The Untimely Death of Bush versus Gore, where I showed that although there were a number of court cases where um, courts tried to use Bush versus Gore to create greater equality in elections, for example, is it constitutional to use punch card machines that lose 8 or 9 or 10% of the votes in some parts of the state but not another for an election? There were some, some courts that initially said that was unconstitutional. All of the cases got reversed uh, as they went up. And so it looked like Bush versus Gore was dead, that the language in Bush versus Gore to create, use that to create greater equality elections was not going to go anywhere. However, things are different in the Sixth Circuit. And that, that case I told you about with the 798 uh, uh, wrong precinct case, there was a, an election dispute called uh, Hunter versus Hamilton County Election Board involving a low-level juvenile court race. 
where the Sixth Circuit issued an opinion that seemed to suggest that once you count, no, it didn't seem to suggest, it held that once you count some wrong precinct votes cast because of poll worker error, you have to count all the wrong precinct votes uh, cast because of poll worker error. Now there's a case that's heading up to the Sixth Circuit that says, is there a constitutional right to have wrong precinct votes cast uh, uh, because of poll worker error counted, even if it has, they haven't been counted at all? Do you have a right to have your vote counted? You can't be disenfranchised because of poll worker error. A district court judge just said yes, relying on Bush versus Gore and that Hunter case. That case is going to the Sixth Circuit. That's the one of two that could end up at the Supreme Court. And if the Sixth Circuit does, in this case, what it did uh, in earlier cases, it could well divide on party lines. The other case uh, is the one that got some attention last week. Uh, Ohio had withdrawn the three most re the, the three uh, early election days closest to election day had, with, had taken those away. But because of some odd legislative uh, maneuvering, it retained that right for overseas voters, military voters and others, who happen to be in Ohio on, uh, uh, on those three days. And a district court issued an opinion that said, once the state gave that right and then took it away, but gave it to some people, maybe, because it was discretionary, that violates Bush versus Gore. That case is also going up to the Sixth Circuit and could divide. So we'll know, I think, better at the end of this election whether Bush versus Gore gets revived. So far it hasn't, but it could happen. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about some of the other stuff that we've heard about in Florida that you haven't talked about, like the uh, the increase in knocking felons off the rolls and also the registration issue where they sort of stepped up the standards for registration that caused legal women voters to rock the vote to pull out, first of all. And second question is, I wonder if there's sort of a psychological element to this. If the push to get more restrictive regimes in place might serve to get some people to just stay home on election day because they don't want the embarrassment of going there and being told that they can't vote. Yeah, let me take your last point first because I think it's a very important one. Wendy and I were talking about this before we started, is that uh, a lot of this is meant to, I think, make it harder, not harder, that's the word I use, make it more frustrating for casual voters to vote. So first time voters, voters have only voted a few times, maybe aren't sure if they're registered or polling place. Anything that makes it harder for those voters who don't have a habit or pattern of voting, they hear about all of these problems at the polls, maybe they're going to be poll watchers. This is the big issue now with True the Vote, and whether they're going to be showing up in uh, Democratic areas and trying to uh, uh, challenge voters. All of that, I think, could have a psychological effect, and that may be the intent of some of the <coughs> action to try to make it more difficult or make people think it's going to be a hassle to vote. I also think I should say that uh, if Florida and Ohio end up not having early voting on those last three days, which is, I think, where we're likely to end up, although we're not sure, that that could well lead to long lines on election day, which could lead some voters to be frustrated and not vote, which could also lead to lawsuits on election day to keep the polls open longer. I'm sure that those lawsuits are already being prepared by some, and then to uh, emergency appeals to try and block that. Uh, in terms of what else is happening in Florida, uh, that the, the most onerous of the new Florida rules, it seems to me, were the rules that made it very difficult for third party groups to register voters, like the League of Women Voters. It's true that Acorn had a problem with uh, false registrations. The League of Women Voters didn't. And lots of groups do very good voter registration efforts, and these rules were so tough that they were worried they were going to face criminal liability for registered voters. That law, that, that, that case is now settled. The rules are now on, but the damage has been done. The figures, you know, I think there's some question about the figures, but it looks like steep decline in registration, especially among Democrats, over the last year while this law was in effect. And it's not clear that Democrats are able to make that up in, in time for election. Thank you for your talk. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the United States is not the only country that has um, elections of this sort. And I was wondering, as we work our way through best practices to apply here, whether in voter suppression or voter um, fraud control situations, uh, what do we learn from um, elections abroad in peer countries with parliamentary democracies that, that can enlighten us on? 
Yeah, this, that's a great question. Uh, I started, this is my first uh, part of my book tour in the United States, but I gave this talk in uh, London in the House of Lords to a group of election uh, reformers and people who care about election administration, and boy, did I make them feel good about their election? <laughs> <laughs> we thought we had problems. Wait, she's the Secretary of State and she's the head of the Fish Committee. They don't know odd and even it's different ballots, and they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that this is how we run. You know, this is you know one of the world's great democracies, and we can't uh, accurately count our votes or know how many people should be registered. You know, it's completely illogical. Uh, in 2004, I went to uh, Australia and I met with. Uh, Australian election officials. They have a system of nonpartisan national election administration. You walk into any polling place in the country, the ballot format's the same. The professional workers know what to do. The voter registration rolls are national. If you move, your registration form moves with you. If you fill out a change of address card, your registration moves with you. We don't have to have people. There, there are logical <coughs> places and problems of voter confidence in the system. Voter confidence is high. Voter fraud is not a major issue. There was an issue in the UK a few years ago involving absentee, or postal voting as they call it. Absentee balloting is the biggest problem with fraud anywhere, uh, because uh, aside from election officials committing fraud, because the ballots are out of the control of election officials. But there's a lot that we can learn from uh, other countries. The problem is one of path dependence. We have been historically uh, a system since the colonies where we've administered our elections on the local level. I talked about the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, which was created by Congress. It's part of the Help America Vote Act. The National Association of Secretaries of State, which is the, the chief election officers, partisan election officials elected in, I think, 33 states, they came out with a resolution calling for the EAC to be disbanded. And they continue to call for the EAC to be disbanded, even though it's a purely advisory group. So aside from the Democratic-Republican divide, the voter fraud, voter integrity divide, there's also a, a turf <laughs> war where local election officials and state officials don't want to give up their power to, to uh, federal government. The House uh, divided on party lines to cut off all the funding for the EAC. So we are so far from being able to implement best practices on national level, it's not even close. If you look on the state level, when state, when state election reforms are being implemented, they're being implemented almost everywhere on party line votes. So election day registration, which a lot of people on the left think is a great idea, it's only getting support of Democrats, not Republicans. Voter ID, with the exception of Rhode Island, which has its own interesting politics there, only Republicans or almost only Republicans voting for these laws, almost only Democrats voting against them. We're not finding a way to bridge the divide. And if Bush versus Gore didn't do it, I'm not sure what will. I talk in the book, I say, you think about the way people normally respond to disasters is they plan for the last disaster. So in Japan now, they're building seawalls to stop the tsunami from hitting the next time, right? But we're not even doing that. We're not even fixing the problems we had with our last election. In uh, California in 2003, we had a recall election. We had 135 candidates on the ballot. I don't know if you remember this. This is when Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected. It was because of a quirk in the uh, California Elections Code. If you looked up what the rules were for recall elections, it said for how to get nominated to be on the ballot. It said, um, the usual nomination rules shall apply. So you turn to the usual nomination rules, which are contained in different sections of the election code. The first uh, rule in the usual nomination rules, it says, these rules shall not apply to recall elections. <laughs> I wrote, I think, three op-eds and spoke at a bunch of forums that changed this law. Why should we have Gallagher and porn stars and Gary Coleman running for governor? All you needed was 65 signatures and $3,000 and you got free publicity to run for governor. California legislature, which is dominated by Democrats, didn't change the law. There's inertia, there's partisanship, and there's not a lot of interest. You know, people say to me, oh, you're lucky your book came out now. Well, I'm not lucky. I, killed myself last year, so it would come out this year. This is the only time people pay attention. The reason I'm doing the book turnout, now people are paying attention. No one will pay, if, if we don't have an election meltdown, no one will care about these issues until 2015. And by then it'll be too late, and we'll be talking about the new voter purge that's starting in Florida, and, and the cycle will continue. So, you know, I, I'm, the book is uh, very pessimistic. There was a, a review of the book. Kirkus Review said something like, an astute but not terribly uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about right. You worry that the, the press 
covers these issues too much on the one hand and on the other hand without getting at what's the stronger hand. And if you're worried about that, I was struck about how you, you're fair, very fair in looking at these things, but sometimes you can be heard as saying, oh, it's only 1%, whereas other times you're saying 1% is too damn many. And sometimes you can be heard as not saying, but there isn't a good reason. So it's a double barrel question. Are you worried about the press? And how do you, as a academic, um, resolve to handle your own comments if you're worried about that? That's a great question. That's something I constantly struggle with. Uh, what I say in the preface of the book is that Democrats, uh, Republicans are more to blame than Democrats, but Democrats are not blameless. So as he says, 75, 80% of the problems here are caused by Republicans, 20% by Democrats. I'm not going to impose a false even uh, handedness on the truth. But I do think that there is exaggeration on the Democratic side. Uh, and that's a subtle message. That's not a message you can get across in a 10 second interview. Um, and you know, so sometimes it depends on what I'm at. So if the question is, you know, are millions of voters going to be disenfranchised? I'd say probably not. If the question is, is there any good reason to have the state voter ID law, and is it going to uh, disenfranchise some voters, the answer is yes. But you know, it's hard to, in this environment, it's hard to speak of subtlety. And while I see myself as taking a middle of the road position, and I get some hate mail from Democrats, I get about three times as much hate mail from Republicans. Go to um, the Republican National Lawyers Association blog, and you'll see I'm, and other, there are other blogs, I'm routinely attacked as a shill for the Democratic Party. I mean, I don't think the Democrats, if they're paying me off, they're not getting their money's worth, because I mean, I'm not towing the party line. But, uh, but I do think that, that's, that it's hard, and uh, uh, I struggle with that all the time. I had a, I have a question about legislative deference. Um, you mentioned that um, a lot of times, the, in the court cases surrounding voter ID, uh, there's been a lot of legislative deference. And I want to contrast that to the campaign finance cases where just this past week in the Eighth Circuit, there was very little legislative deference um, over disclosure thresholds. Um, and how do, you, how do courts square the different standard for campaign finance versus voter ID? And is this an example where we can make uh, lemonade out of lemons uh, and ask for more legislative deference in the campaign finance context. Well, it's interesting you make that contrast, but some are, sometimes I hear this argument when I say there's no good evidence that uh, uh, voter ID laws help promote voter confidence. People will say to me, but you support campaign finance reform, and there's uh, the appearance of corruption standard. There's no good evidence that uh, campaign finance laws um, prevent the appearance of corruption. I actually think there's a good, that's a pretty good argument. I'm not a big believer in appearance of corruption. I think the court has the wrong definition of corruption. And what we need to ask about is not the appearance of corruption, but the actuality of a conflict of interest that comes when uh, people have to rely on millions of dollars raised uh, and spent privately. Um, but the courts generally have been terrible on evidentiary standards for judging these things. The, when it comes to campaign finance, if it's a campaign contribution limit, at least until recently, it was incredibly easy to uphold any law. Any amount of evidence would do. Justice Souter in the Shrink, Missouri case said, well, there were a couple of newspaper editorials about corruption. That's enough for us. In contrast, when it comes to a spending limit, with one exception, the Austin case, which has now been overruled, the courts never found enough evidence. And Justice uh, Kennedy unbelievably says in Citizens United that independent expenditures cannot corrupt or create the appearance of corruption. Great social science that it can have such certainty. Um, in the voter ID case in Pennsylvania, the judge says, there's no evidence that this prevents fraud, but the Supreme Court tells us we don't need any evidence. So what the courts seem to do about evidence, and this is true of both liberal and conservative judges, is they seem to reach a value judgment as to what the big threat is, the First Amendment threat, or the threat to our democratic elections, as Justice Breyer put it, and then they reverse engineer how much evidence you need to reach the conclusion under the level of scrutiny they need to apply to what the outcome should be. So I'm very uh, skeptical that courts are actually doing anything important with the, with the evidence that they look at. 
You mentioned that uh, Democrats and Republicans are united against automated voter registration and a national voter ID, but I'm wondering if you just take the first part. Modernization is something we work hard at, and um, we know that there have been leaders in modernization who are not totally partisan the way you'd expect. Maricopa County has modernized and seen great fiscal results. And so I guess I'm wondering, do you think we're naive about the possibility for this uh, for modernization, especially because I think it has the added benefit of taking the wind out of a lot of these purge lawsuits that you spoke of. And do you think that's been branded yet as a partisan issue? And if not, do you have any suggestions about how we can avoid that and, and keep pushing it as a common sense fiscal reform that benefits everyone? Yeah, when I said that uh, it's uh, uh, uniting Democrats and Republicans, I'm talking about on the national level. I think on the state and local level, especially in states that have professional election administration. There is the possibility to improve things, and it creates less room for litigation when there you know, are fewer problems with the voting rolls. You don't have True the Vote suing to clean up the rolls, and you don't have other groups suing to make it easier to register voters, because it already is easy I mean, to have online registration. Uh, I do think things can happen on the state and local level. What I think can't happen is uh, to get anything out of Congress. So I know, and I know you know, that uh, uh, Senator <laughs> Schumer looked like he was going to push this issue, and then all of a sudden it was gone. And I think it was gone because it was not going to get, forget bipartisan support, it was not going to get Ben Nelson support, so it disappeared. And it, it's just, the Congress is hopeless right now when it comes to, or maybe it's hopeless generally, but it's hopeless now, especially when it comes to uh, election reform. And I don't know what it's going to take to move us beyond that. But I think working on the state level, which Brennan Center is doing, and the local level is a much more fruitful way to try and get something done. And if you can work with professionals, uh, uh, it's going to be that much easier. Uh, there's a review of my book in the American Prospect by Rick Vallely, who I think is uh, terrific. And the review ends, he said, what can we do about all this? He said, the single most important step we need, or can do right now, is professionalization of our <coughs> That We need to have person should not have the votes kept on her laptop, and the person who's supervising her knows nothing about computers. Forget that she's a Republican and the other one's a Democrat. Competence. Poll workers should know what an odd or an even number is, or the system should be de de devised so that it doesn't depend upon poll workers who have to figure out what's an odd or even number. There's a lot that could be done there. The big, the big problem there is, is resources as well. <laughs> Getting the money for that in times of <coughs> Okay, it wasn't a major case, but I know of a woman who came to the polls and her name was just gone. And New York, this is in New York, and we already had provisional ballots. And the worker knew nothing about it and just said, you can register, you can't vote. And um, my friend didn't know enough to claim. It just seems like part of the problem is you have these workers that work one day a year or two days a year or something, and they just, like the odd and even numbers, they just don't know what they're doing. I don't even know what we could ever do about that problem. You know, if you think about elections, there's really nothing else like this. We have this massive undertaking that has to all happen on one day during this period where you're using temporary workers and you've got to get everything right. It's very hard to do, which is one of the reasons I really like early in-person voting. Because first of all, it gives poll workers practice. And second, it alleviates the burdens on election day. So even putting aside you know, any of the partisanship of any of it, early voting helps in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, there's a group called Why Tuesday that's trying to get rid of the Tuesday voting. Well, if we move to early voting, we don't need to worry the Tuesday's election day because people have lots of opportunities. I think that's a reform that a lot of people should get around, but even that has now gotten caught up in the partisan fights over election rules. I, I, there's just a few more minutes, so we'll have time for one more question from the audience and then uh, from me. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, one sort of two-part question. Uh, one, uh, obviously, states like Pennsylvania and Florida are sort of being looked at heavily. Are there any other states that you think that um, the media should be looking at uh, more heavily in terms of voter ID laws? Um, and also, what's the cost to the states to have to enforce some of these voter ID laws that have come up? Yeah, I've seen some, there was just a study released last week that said that Minnesota, which is, they're going to vote on a voter ID amendment, could cost, uh, rural counties millions of dollars to implement. 
I, I can't tell you how valid that is. I haven't read the study. But I do know that there are costs associated with doing these things. Certainly Pennsylvania that's going to try. Pennsylvania admitted, besides admitting that there was no impersonation fraud, they said at least 750,000 voters don't have ID right now, and another 500,000 people potentially have expiring IDs before the election. That's going to be expensive to get that all processed. And if you worry about uh, poll workers not knowing how to do things, try going to the DMV, <laughs> where uh, you know that's like a nightmare in many states. Um, so there are costs associated with it, and there are costs associated with training people to do it. In terms of where to watch, it's not just for voter ID. Here are the states I'm watching the most, Ohio, Florida, Colorado. Possibly Wisconsin, if voter ID comes back in, which I think is very unlikely, although there's a move for that. Uh, then Pennsylvania, but, uh, but Colorado. Can you tell us why you're watching those states? Uh, well, there's litigation there. Uh, there's also, um, uh, Ohio is, I mean, it could be the whole election comes down to Ohio. Ohio already has these two lawsuits that I've talked about, and there's more to come. Uh, Florida, we've talked about those lawsuits. Colorado has a particularly partisan Secretary of State, Scott Gessler, who's been doing a, a controversial uh, uh, purges of voters and taken some other steps unilaterally. He's been uh, slapped down by the courts a little bit, but he, he seems to be very strong in, in pushing his way of doing things. In Colorado, these are swing states, and they're states where there's a lot of controversy. Uh, so that's why I'm looking at Pennsylvania, we've got the, the voter ID law. Okay. I'm gonna ask one more question. Before I do so, I wanna note that there are copies of the voting wars on for sale in the corner over there. I highly recommend them. I urge everyone to run a don't walk in with them. Um, but, and, and, uh, and to read it avidly. Um, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the partisan nature of the voting wars, um, as, as you, uh, and ask you about that. Um, you've mentioned both the divide and how people look at, um, look at the voting issues with um, whether they're um, elected officials, um, election administrators, or <coughs> judges, or individuals who are part of the counting process and uh, hired by nonpartisan actors, people you know, view things through a lens that is colored a little bit by partisanship with um, Democrats um, uh, interested more in access and Republicans concerned more about voter fraud. Um, and both sides um, that are in <coughs> charge of making our election rules, whether it be legislators or administrators, um, tend to act to benefit um, their side's electoral prospects, whether it's purposefully or, or not. Um, the um, I guess I have several follow-up questions relating to that. First, um, you know, as it turns out, um, only one side believes that its electoral prospects will be advanced by passing rules that um, that could depress voting turnout. Um, and how do you account for that in the public conversation? That's in part a demographic um, fact because, as it turns out, the groups who are most likely affected by these laws are groups that um, people believe are and that historically have tended to vote um, um, more democratic. Um, and, and how do you account for that in the conversation, given that um, you know either side would undoubtedly try to pass laws to um, benefit their own electoral prospects, and there's no kind of countervailing weight on the other side. Um, the other question is, the public um, really dislikes partisans manipulating the elections for their own benefit, and they don't care who it is. They just don't like the politicization of this process. And continuing the conversation of a you know, war between Republicans and Democrats and Republican worldview and Democratic worldview misses a little bit of what's at stake here for the public, which is you know, a, a broader control over our democracy and a fair ground rules um, that we can all trust with the, um, where, where the partisans are you know, fighting to get our votes, not how, um, how we vote. You know, so how do we, at this point, um, barring a, a world where we have a you know, new nonpartisan professional election administration, how do we change that conversation? So the conversation is not a conversation between is this going to help Republicans and Democrats and how many and what's the percentage turnout effect, but where we're actually talking about what's really at stake, democracy and the vote and fair rules um, and a fair system. Great questions. Let me start by putting in a plug for uh, a conference on Friday that's going to be webcast. Uh, at UC Irvine Law, where I am, on uh, nonpartisanship in uh, election administration, redistricting, and campaign finance. And so if you go to law.uci.edu, all day conference, we're going to look at these very issues of how do you know if nonpartisanship is better than bipartisanship or partisan administration of election? Partisanship 
in the administration of elections is sometimes defended as a way of promoting accountability. Uh, and you know, if you elect the Republican Secretary of State, that person is going to be more interested in cost cutting. Or in California, we have a Democratic Secretary of State who uh, she put herself out there as someone who cared about election technology and modernization, and she was elected. So, you know, there are trade-offs on these things. It's very hard to get the conversation off the topic of who's winning, who's losing. You saw the stories in the Times and the Wall Street Journal, that's how they're written. It's part of the problem of horse race coverage generally. I'm glad the public's concerned at all. I'd rather them be concerned about issues of the greater integrity of the process. Um, but this is, this is how we get the public to pay attention. This is the moment. And so I try and talk to people about moving forward. But I've been doing that in, the impetus to write this book is that I've been doing this in 2004, 2006, 2008, 2010. Every election, the same discussion, and things only seem to be getting worse. And the fact that all of these laws, every voter ID law with the exception of Rhode Island, and all of these coming back on early voting, they're all being passed by Republicans and opposed by Democrats. It's hard not to see them through that way. On your first question about uh, why is it only one party, I'm kind of paraphrasing you, so I don't know if we're about, that, uh, that is proposing laws that are uh, uh, <coughs> looking to decrease the vote, uh, I'm reminded at the beginning of the new book by uh, Von Spakovsky and Fund called Who's Counting. I, I haven't been able to get past chapter one. But in chapter one, uh, <laughs> they say, uh, why do we vote? Both Republicans and Democrats commit voter fraud, but we, most of this book has instances of Democrats committing fraud. Why is that? Because Democrats tend to be poor and they commit most of the fraud. And I was thinking, I don't know if they believe that, but if that's what they're selling, then it's not surprising to me that uh, if you believe that, uh, the, uh, that the system is being, that, that the elections are being stolen, by democratic elites that are manipulating the poor minorities, then this is the kind of laws that you pass. And uh, it's a very warped worldview, but I, uh, there was a, there's a guy named Matthew Vadim who um, wrote a column, I can't remember who it was for, if you, if you uh, Google his name on the election law blog, you'll find this, where he said that registering the poor to vote was un-American. Because the poor are going to vote for, in their self-interest, that's opposed to everybody else, <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to support a larger welfare state. This is America. And I think if, if you're starting with that worldview, it's very easy to get to where you're passing laws that are going to shrink the number of poor minority voters who are going to vote. And it's unfortunate that's the world that doesn't exist. That's a really positive note. <laughs> <laughs> we have a positive note to end on. I'm uh, going to go forward before we... Uh, I, I look at uh, the Electoral College, and it does not look close right now. And from the point of view of the election administrator's prayer, that's a good thing. Um, <coughs> but keep your eye on the Senate. Uh, 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 so, so the chances of an election meltdown are still quite small. Uh, just not because we've done anything to improve things. We haven't. But because uh, the chances of a razor-thin election happening on the presidential scale are still relatively small. Thank you so much.